I get paid for it since 30 years. So um, we are a family business uh, dealing with intro logistics. We are a system provider. We're doing machines, products, uh, transporting any goods from A to B. And uh, yeah, some facts about me. My favorite beer brand is Yeva. Yeah, if it's too bitter for you, you are too sweet for this beer. And um, we, did, we discussed already about soccer clubs, and here is my ultimate outing. I'm supporting Schalke 04. I know this, this is not the best story to tell in Berlin, but you won 2-0 uh, in Schalke, and we left the points with you. I have uh, two great kids. Uh, I'm married since uh, 21 year, and uh, my kids are 20 and 18. You see everything's in sequence. And I have uh, some more years to go until I retire. As said, I'm 55 years old. And the good thing about this is you all keep me a little bit younger than I really am. So I'm really enjoying to be here again after last year's uh, takeoff. And I'm looking forward to a great event tonight. So my name is Fabian Rosicka, I'm the founder of Oculus. Um, we basically work towards a modular production. So you might ask the question, uh, what does logistics have to do with production? Um, basically, we are asking the question why we still produce in the same way like Ford invented 100 years ago, even though the car looks or the product looks so much different. Was 100 years ago, one, one product was like another. Nowadays, hardly any product is like another. So, what we are working towards is transforming the assembly line as, as we have it since 100 years to from 1D to 2D. So basically we spread all the work modules in space and create thereby flexibility. So basically each and every product has its own, own plan, looks for the stations that it really needs and really only visits those stations. So you can get basically compare it with a big shopping mall. If you enter the shopping mall and there would be an assembly line, then it would guide you through the entire entire shopping mall. You would never, never get home again. So what you do with, with, with your intelligence, you look at what do I really need um, and where is the shortest queue and then only visit those stores. So basically we bring this intelligence that we as a human have and we don't even think about to the production and thereby create flexibility. And I think that's also the link to the logistics because what really enables this form of production is, is logistics. So basically we don't use the conveyor belt anymore, we use AGVs in order to move the product, but not only the product, but also the parts to the stations. And therefore we use a, a fleet management system that synchronizes those fleets and really makes sure that the right product is in place before the product arrives and then the assembly worker just picks and, and assembles. So this is what we're working on. We are currently 30 people. Um, we provide both the software that controls everything and the hardware. So we designed our own AGV that can carry everything up to one ton completely free in space. And yeah, so we're based in Ingolstadt and uh, currently running up um, projects with customers in the automotive industry. But what, what's really interesting to us, we, we developed this thing for automotive industry, but so many people approached us and said, well, basically we do have the same problem. We do need to decide for a production, but we just can't tell the customer what to buy. So we need this flexibility, and this is why I think, and I really have the belief that modular production can change the way how we produce things, not only in automotive, but in all industries wherever there is multiple and serious production. So by myself, I'm... Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer, so for me it's really like bringing the parts together from electronics to from software and the mechanics, and this is really what excites me about this. Thanks. So it looks pretty much like a stereotype, for, uh, stereotype to me. Here's the startup focusing on flexibility, and here's the logistics incumbent focusing on speed and, and very large volumes. Christoph, is that true? Uh, yes, for the time being, we're focusing on throughput. And uh, you brought this picture with a shopping mall. Great picture I want to take. If you're on a shopping mall on Thursday morning, all this works. But if you are in a shopping mall on Saturday evening, Christmas, 
Saturday in December, you see where the problem is. Yeah? If you, at the end of the day, have throughput, which is not to be handled by a lot of carts, a lot of vehicles, then you get stuck. And uh, at that point, I say uh, continuous systems um, still will have their place in the future once we talk about throughput and uh, once, we, uh, once we really need a secure throughput all over the day. And uh, yes, it may be in, in as said Thursday mornings that it works. Once you say we want to optimize throughput on a card which looks for his own way, optimization finally looks like to say we are optimizing routes. We, we tell the cards uh, which main route they take like an autobahn. Yeah? And, and once the throughput gets even worse, you say, okay, and now you have to take this autobahn and this exit and here and here and here. And then you have a sequence of cards and then you can directly take a solder because this costs half of it. It's definitely much cheaper than what you were talking about. And uh, yeah, I'm not saying that you don't have a good niche mark, but not more. To well, be a bit provocative. <laughs> I was told to be so here. <laughs> I'm like, fair, fair enough, but just let me give you another picture. Think of a very big supermarket, not like the ones that we have in, in Germany, like in France. You have 100 checkouts. So on Thursday morning, they open 20 checkouts, and they are perfectly or perfectly utilized. When the when the all the customers come Friday afternoon and they are shopping for the weekend, then they open another 60. So the 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 ability to breathe and to adapt on the load in the system is with a flexible approach in a given in a totally different perspective because like. With a static system, you have a certain peak, and you can't increase that one. If the if the if the big supermarket really finds out it's it's championship weekend, then they just add one or two more checkouts and even adapt on a higher load. So I think that that ability is is there, and also we can we see all the, the supermarkets that you can you can you really have the only limitation is space. So if you can add space, you can add output. So I don't think that there is a limitation concerning throughput. If you can add space, fine. But in many existing spaces, you cannot add space anymore. Yeah, look at the uh, uh, at the logistic uh, centers we have all over Germany now. Yeah, we're talking to our local town, asking for another square meter. It took us ten years to get it. Yeah, so if you need to get the maximum throughput in a minimum square meters then you are out of it. And if you have a supermarket with 100 cashiers and you use only 20 on Thursday morning, it's a high investment for 80 to stand around, right? Yeah, like the, the, the problem is that you don't have them stand, around, stand, stand, stand there and do nothing. You can just leave them at home or just make them work, do something else. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you. If we have a limited space and we have a peak amount, then, then the sorter will be the most space efficient point. But if we, if we need to decide for a fulfillment center now, and we don't know what we need in the next couple of years, then the flexibility really is, is with the room day to be, from my perspective. This was Michael and Hompel. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you. And uh, I think there, there, there will be a, a match of both. Yeah? So the, the, the bigger the spaces you can use and the lower the throughput is, the more an AGV system can, comes into place. The higher throughput on a lower space, the more the continuous systems come into space. And I think there are different uh, yeah, advantages and different disadvantages to both of it. Yeah, if, if we talk about security, for example, if an AGV is running into a person, Sensoric today is very intelligent yeah, that this thing stops. But if you have hundreds of these around, it also costs some money. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. security, I mean, we give, whoever designs AGVs really makes sure that they don't run into anybody. And like you pay the sensor companies a big amount of money to make sure that it, that doesn't happen. So I don't think security or safety in that scenario is an issue. But like maybe coming back to the production um, example, whenever it comes to, to a homogeneous load, then I would always say, don't, don't go come to us just go to somebody who can provide you with an assembly line. 
when it comes to being flexible, adapting dynamically to the load, then I think the advantages are with the modular production. And maybe this also goes for, for our discussion here. And I think the strengthens on both sides, and it really comes to the point deciding the right system for the right use case. I can agree to that one, yeah. It's not a black and white, it's always a, a question what fits best for a special requirement of the customers, and uh, this is what we always have to look in. Are there industries where you're gonna fight for customers across the world any, any time in the future? <coughs> Why not be strong in parcel sortation and in baggage handling? Is that something where you, where you see um, um, possible, um, that there will be cost, possible customers for you as well? well? Well, I think in the end the customer will decide what, what really is, is his requirements and it will really change. Like, I don't think the, the, the two systems fight against each other because both systems have, have their strengths. So um, I think the, the, the customer will decide for the right system, for the right use case. At least I'm very confident that they're clever enough to do so. And uh, if we talk about uh, production, as you said, we, we have a single thing which goes to many stations, uh, then I think we don't talk about continuous systems. But if we talk, for example, a parcel sorting system with 35,000 throughput per hour, uh, you, you cannot handle it with, with uh, uh, autonomous cars, whatever it is. And uh, so there will be a combination, uh, I, I think. And I think that throughput still matters. Uh, Michael Litton Hoppe just said no. Uh, this will be uh, done in, in uh, some weeks, so to say. Let's see how it works and, and what comes out. I'm still looking forward to that. I know that there is uh, um, that there is a fight of the systems finally, uh, but as said before, the use case is what counts, and at the end of the day, uh, cost also matters. And if we talk about uh, a fleet system of no idea 500, 600, 700 of these cards, uh, we talk about a software which is really complex, which needs to be customized, and, and where you put a lot of money in. Also, the hardware is not for free. The more sensors, the more sensoric you have in, uh, the more software you have to write, the higher the price at the end of the day is. And a continuous system today is state of the art. And But yeah, it's a use case of the customer. Finally, his decision, or her decision. Very well. 10 years is, I think, a, very, um, a bit long in terms of the time frame to make predictions, but um, five years from now, what will the role of human workers be? Will they, will they work alongside new technologies, or do you think we are getting closer and closer to a fully automated warehouse and production line? Well, for, for us, it's, it's a two-step approach. So we, with Oculus, concentrate on, on the product and logistic flow. We still see the worker really, really capable. The worker has all the senses, he has all the experience, he can really adapt to different uh, different challenges super fast. So what we're aiming at is cutting out all the waste. So we don't want to have the worker waiting, we don't have the worker moving, we just want to have the worker there where, where really value is created. So um, for us, that, that's what we can, can deliver you and we can offer you, but I know that there's companies uh, like we will see later the, later in the evening that are working on the aspect of really automating the picking itself. But for us, it's really like cutting out all the waste first. Um, I think uh, picking is one of the most challenging tasks to automate. And uh, I'm now 30 years, as I said, in my job. And I know that already 30 years ago, we tried to automate picking. And we always brought it to a, a, to a accuracy of, of 92, 93, 96. We had some pairs of socks where we even made 98%. That is not enough. It needs to be a 99.95 accuracy. Otherwise, you can, you can forget about automatic picking. Today, sensoric and technology and software is much smarter than it has been years ago. So I think that we will come to a point where we have much more automatic picking than we have today. Are we able to do everything? I still have my doubt. Uh, so we will always have a kind of mixture. And the question is, what does the growth rate of this business uh, tell us over the years? 
and let's put it that way, if we save productivity 10% per year, but have a growth rate of 10% per year, you know, we will have the same people working there. So very, very difficult to predict. Yeah, for, for myself as well, I, I always said like, it's, it's going to take five plus years until yesterday. Then I met one guy at, a, at another panel, is sitting over there, Yahoo from Ryzen Robotics, and he decreased the time frame from my perspective. So I tried to bring him in here, and thank you for your flexibility. He will he will present his solution later on. And it's really amazing what technology is is capable of today. There are really really smart ideas on the horizon. So as said, I think that we will be able to automate much more of picking than we do today. Will it be hundred percent finally? Let's see. So yeah, that leads um, directly to my new question, to my next question. Um, Christoph, you know as well as um, as a uh, few people that you have given a lot of commitments as a CEO. You have given commitments to all stakeholders, your family, employees, customers in terms of strategy, margins, products. So it's very hard for you to break your commitments and uh, reinvent the wheel, wheel and do something new. At the same time, you see a lot of startups coming into logistics. I would say the um, the industry is uh, very much in vogue now with startup founders and with uh, VCs. More on that later, maybe. How do you how do you keep up as a large corporate incumbent? <laughs> Easy question. Easy question. Yeah. How do we keep up? So we have a conventional corporate business, so to say. And uh, yeah, maybe I tell the story a little bit uh, 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 in, in an analogy uh, with our um, uh, investments in China 15 years ago. We invested in China 15 years ago and everybody asked me, hey, what are you doing there? And I said, very easy, in 10 years, nobody will buy a bucket elevator, bandage, bandage shield, sheet metal from Germany. It will be imported from China. And better we have the brand name Bäumer on it than it is a Chinese brand. And, and this was, uh, a very easy decision to take because it was clear that the future is changing. Same here with, with our business, what we do in intra logistics these days. It will definitely not be the same in five or ten years. It, we see it everywhere that, that things change dramatically. And here are so many so smart people. Yeah? They will give us really a hard time in our core business. And uh, then we said, okay, the ultimate challenge and the ultimate disruption for all the intra logistics was already on TV 30 years ago. Scotty beam me up. Yeah, that was the ultimate disruption for every material handling com company. Yeah, it's not just uh, by chance that this company here is named Beam. Yeah, if they really invent beaming, this would be a great thing to do for Boimer Group because then the 4,200 people which work hard today in Boimer Group then work with Beam. And this is my how to say this is my philosophy also being responsible for 4,200 people, to say there are new business models coming up and I cannot promise each and everybody to keep his job what he's doing today. But what my target is to say, I have responsible for, for responsibility for these people, for these families, and at least give them a chance that the transforming of the whole company can take place with our influence and not that others all, all, uh, all of a sudden take over at the left side and we say, whoops, this is not what we have seen. And this is the, the reason uh, uh, behind uh, this activity here in Berlin. And I'm really happy to, to have this team found here. Yeah, the first was you, now we have three, four others on board and, and uh, we had a meeting two days ago. And it's really good to see that, that people are involved here sharing the same values and still being innovative enough to be part of this really innovative um, atmosphere which we have here in Berlin. And our task is to build the bridge between what innovative culture offers in Berlin and what experience offers in our company. And if we are able to combine the best of both worlds, we really will create a big thing. If we are not able to do that because of whatever reasons, blocking in the one part, being jealous in the other, whatever it is, if we don't succeed on working together on our, how to say, values we share, on our teamwork, if we don't succeed, then it will not work. Fair enough. Let's change perspective. Fabian, 
Um, you, are, you are very successfully working with Audi, or are you? And uh, from your point of view, what are the benefits and the pitfalls, the dangers in working with large corporations, be it Mittelstand companies or stock-listed stock international super corporations like Audi and then Volkswagen? Well, well, we've been fairly fortunate that we that we got the trust and the opportunity working with with big uh, automotive players uh, like like you mentioned. Um, I think that the opportunity in there is you get a very good understanding for the problem, and you have a very very big market already in one in one of the corporates. The the pitfall or the the the, the, the big point that that I also heard had to learn. You need to convince two kinds of people. You need to convince the people who are going to work with the system, and you need to convince the people who decide the system. So you have to really address the people and understand the people who are going to be in touch with the system and the sea level. And because, like, for these very, very big, big changes, like we, like we are addressing with modular production, it, it doesn't work without the support from sea level and it doesn't work against the people who are going to work in the system. So this is what, what, what really excites us to, to be able and, and to have the chance to, to, to discuss with those two groups. And talking about Mittelstand, I think that is one of the big opportunities for Mittelstand as well, because we see a lot of companies that are still in the hands of the owners, of the founders, and who can make fast decisions. And I think the deciding point with all the new technology which is approaching now is being fast, deciding the right thing, and then really rolling it out fast. That is, that is, I think, the chance for Mittelstand as well. So one, one last question, then we give it over to the audience. Um, the way I understand you is, you say you have to work work with uh, closely with the makers, the engineers, and also the managers. How many people uh, work for your startup? Thirty, that was. And how many do uh, politics? Well, politics is only me. It's <laughs> a healthy ratio. Um, any questions from the audience? Not all at a time. No, we, we have one. Well, uh, thank you. I'm actually really curious to hear your perspective on the Mittelstand in Germany. So from my point of view, the vast amount of Mittelstand companies are fairly behind in terms of getting ready for digitization and anticipating how their core business models are really threatened by new technologies. Now we see here with Weimar Group a company that seems to be like fairly decisive to go into deep technologies, but I really wonder what is about the vast majority of Mittelstand companies that are not going in this direction? How can we motivate them and yeah, open them for the topic? So um, I think the ratio between uh, Mittelstand and uh, big corporates is more or less the same. So I have a lot of colleagues in, in Mittelstand uh, companies, owners, which are really neglecting uh, this whole process of digital transformation. Yeah, they are happy about their iPhone and that's it. Yeah, and, uh, but honestly, I also know a lot of CEOs of big conglomerates, which even also don't have a clue of it. And uh, so the only thing how they learn it is by experience. And the better you are, the quicker you are, the quicker they will recognize that they have to move. And I can only say it's not a question of the size of the company. I think it's a question of how the management, the leaders of the companies are willing to change their focus. And honestly, what I see these days is that in most of the business areas, we have a booming economy and we have all a lot of work to do. And uh, we, in, in, in the corporates, we are turning around in circles. We have so many projects, we have so many daily operative work. And it's really a decision to take, to say, hey, come on, I take these two guys, these three guys, out of my organization, out of my operative business. I give them the time and the freedom to do this here. And uh, yeah, I can, I can, fully understand the perspective of many managers to say, I don't have the people for this for the time being, but I think it's important to have the people for the time being, because maybe in five or six years, they don't have a time being anymore. And 
I don't think that it is a middle stand or a corporate problem. I think it's a problem of quality of management. Fair enough. Big hands of applause for the tour. Thank you very much. Christopher.